Hi, and welcome to Gori in Georgia, the country, not the state for our American friends. I'm sitting here on the stoop of the house in which probably Georgia's most famous son was born. Back in the last quarter of the 1800s, a young seminary student, Josep Djugashvili, was born in that room. His father rented the cellar to make shoes and then the landlord lived in the room over my left shoulder. Many of his friends you know, used a different name to describe young Josep. Rather than calling him Djugashvili, they used the name Stalin. And this house is kept from the time that Stalin died and this whole memorial complex built in a way in which the Georgians themselves must have, well, differences of opinion about whether it needs to stay. After Lenin's death, Stalin took over the Soviet Union and it was only after the collapse of the Soviet Union that a letter was released from Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. A year before his death, he wrote it, to say that he didn't believe Stalin should be leader. Lenin always wanted Trotsky to take over, so it was no surprise after Stalin did take over the Soviet Union that Trotsky was found in exile in Mexico with an ice pick in the back of his head. But Georgia is not just about Stalin and it's not just about this house. So let's take another trip through the rest of Georgia. Let's look at some of the scenery, the nature, the history, the religion, and a country that I've come to actually really enjoy during my visit here. So let's forget about Stalin and let's go to the bits of Georgia that are actually quite fun. I want to go uphill to see an old monastery and there's nothing like bouncing up and down an old road in an old larder to remind yourself of the days of the Soviet Union. One of the things I've got to tell you about Georgia is this country has some of the most spectacular landscape you'll ever see. Some incredible mountains, awesome valleys. And you can see where the last Ice Age glaciers just carved out the shape of this landscape. And of course, on every top peak and above every valley is a monastery built by people that carted heavy stones up kilometers of mountain pass. And boy, am I glad I wasn't a monk in the 1500s. But just take a look at this breathtaking beauty. Georgians traditionally were great metallurgists as well. They were some of the first to cast bronze and copper, and they mined gold. And that's where actually the legend of Jason and the Golden Fleece comes from, because the way they mined gold here was, instead of panning in the rivers, they would get a very dense wool fleece and they would filter the water, and by filtering the water, they'd pick up the gold, and hence the uh, legend of the Golden Fleece. So like many other parts of the Caucasus, Georgia dates its history right back to the very dawn of humanity. You know, Neanderthals lived here. There were civilizations here dating back to BC. The early capitals of Georgia go back 3,000 years. And in all of that time, they've still managed to maintain some of the most breathtaking scenery you'll ever see. Come visit Georgia. Welcome to Uplisikha. This is the old temple to the sun goddess and I like pagan rituals and I like anything to do with sun and flame. But this also says something else about Georgia. Georgia is a matriarchal society and it's matriarchal partly because of the religion represented here in this temple. Goddesses <coughs> and priestesses who sacrificed men particularly gingerhead men. So I would be a little bit worried, except for the fact that you had to be at least six foot tall before you'd be sacrificed. Now, the matriarchal part of society is interesting because Saint Nina, she converted Georgia to Christianity in the fourth century. Where did she succeed when 
Saint Andrew the Apostle failed in the first century. Saint Andrew, after whom I'm named, you know, an apostle of Jesus failed to convert uh, Georgia to Christianity. Well, Saint Nina was female and she first converted the king's wife. And it says a lot about the power of females within this society that it was a female saint that converted the country to Christianity by first converting the king's wife. Now, the final thing to say is King Tumur. She was the king of kings in, uh, in Georgian history. She was the great granddaughter of King David the Builder. Just up in her temple just over here i'll show you there in a second she was crowned prince regent and later was crowned king when she uh, down in the old capital but this is another wonderful story about how women dominate i mean which other countries call their female monarchs kings makes a lot of sense maybe elizabeth should think about that i am standing under the light of justice this hole in the ceiling that lets light down because people used to believe if you stood here, you told the truth because this has two significant roles in history. This was the old pagan court of justice where the priestesses would rule over the accused and the accused would stand here under the ray of light, hopefully telling the truth. But it is also the hall where Tamura was crowned Prince Regent. She before she became king, spent time as Prince Regent. And this is the place where she was crowned. The dual symbolism of using the old pagan temple to endorse the next king, and that king being female. So I'm sitting over a wine cellar. I like wine, and Georgia first started making wine about 8,000 years ago. Interestingly about Georgia, the word for wine cellar, Marani, is one word. In almost every other language, it's a compound noun between two, wine cellar. But no, Marani is one word. That's how important wine is to the Georgians. The Georgian language, by the way, is one of the earliest alphabets in the world as well. The most similar language is the Basques in Northern Spain. Now, why would you ask that? Spain is known as the Iberian Peninsula. But where was the first Iberia? It was actually here in Georgia, and Georgia initially was in two kingdoms. One was the Kingdom of Iberia, and the Basques are said to be the descendants of the Georgians, the original Iberians, and that's why Spain is known as the Iberian Peninsula. There you go, Morani. Hi, and welcome to the Sveti Sokhoveli Church. I love this church, not just because of the architecture, but because of the irony. Now, this church was initially built in the 900s, rebuilt in the 1000s or 1000s, and a few times throughout history. But the reason I love this, it was built under the instructions of King George by architect Constantine. And Constantine himself wasn't even Christian. So when you look around this church, there are all sorts of signs of his belief in old pagan religions. There is a sun clock carved on the outside with the 14 signs of the zodiac, including the two that modern um, astrologers have forgotten. There are two oxen heads on the back of the church, which come from the old pagan temple, which was built on these grounds some thousand years earlier. So it's full of these ironies, but probably the great thing is it's one big FU to the existing church at the time. The Byzantine churches had very strict rules about construction. All sides of the church needed to be symmetrical, all sorts of rules about design. Almost every single one of those rules, this church breaks. And indeed, that's why UNESCO protects this church, because it's the first church which has the elongated design that modern cathedrals are all designed on. So they say this is the first neo-Gothic designed church in the world. So it breaks all the rules, it's got signs of paganism all over it, and the architect that built it wasn't even Christian. So this is my sort of church. I've got to be a little bit quiet because you're not supposed to speak inside this church, but I love this church. And I love this church because it's anti-Christian. As I said, Constantine the architect actually was, actually was pagan. And in the old pagan temple that stood here was a pillar 
and the pillar represented how you got from earth up to the goddess of the sun and when Constantine built this church he built this little chapel inside the church in the same place the pillar stood in the shape of the pillar so it's his way of saying to the world I've built this Christian church but I've also put inside it a pagan pillar and the way he got it through was by saying it represented the conversion to Christianity and painted on the side of this pillar is the original pillar depiction plus the depiction of the king taking Christianity when he saw a uh, solar eclipse. So I love this church because it's not Christian. Again, I've got to be really careful about what I say and how loud I say it, but I love this church because it's so full of pagan symbology. This fresco behind me, which they say was painted somewhere around about the 12th century, has Christ in the middle, but the zodiac signs on the outside. And part of it's supposed to represent Christ finding Nirvana, the Buddhist Nirvana. And they say part of that reason is because of the Buddhism that came up and down the Silk Road was accepted by King David the Builder here and allowed this sort of uh, painting to be put inside the church. So all through this church we have symbols of sun worship, pagan worship, astrological sign, we even have Buddhist Nirvana. I love this church. Morning and welcome to Tbilisi in Georgia. Founded by this guy Vakdan the Wolf-Headed in the 5th century. Legend has it that he saw a falcon and a pheasant fighting in the sky and the falcon chased the pheasant down to a hot spring and boiled it alive and he said, what a cool place to build a city. So here he founded Tbilisi. Tbilisi is the modern capital of Georgia and it has within it a great mix of people. We have over here a mosque, next to it a, an Armenian Gregorian church crossing over a Jewish sector until you get to the Georgian Orthodox Church. As I said, it's the capital of modern Georgia, so let's have a look around and see what we think of Tbilisi. Hi, this is the Medeki Church in Tbilisi. It was built by King Dimitri in the year 1266, and it's said to be the last medieval construction in Tbilisi, because after this one was built, they didn't do any more construction for a couple of hundred years until they finally kicked the Mongolians out of Georgia. Now, let's put this in historical context. 1266 was the year of the Treaty of Perth, when the Western Isles were leased by Norway to Scotland. And the reason that's important is in 1266, Olaf the Black on the Isle of Man, the descendant of King Harald Hadrada of Norway, fostered his son to the Sheriff of Skye on Dunvegan, and he had two children, Le uh, Tormod and Torkel, and Tormod and Torkel were the first sons of Leod, the son of Olaf the Black, and hence the first MacLeods. So when this church was built, was the same year as the MacLeod family was founded. Georgia, home of wine for thousands of years and then grapes everywhere dangling in the public. Oh, God, they're sweet. Yeah, lovely. I know what I'm having for lunch today. Welcome to Sioni Cathedral here in Tbilisi. It is without doubt the most beautiful of the churches and cathedrals I've been in in Georgia because it still has the wonderful frescoes painted on the inside. This cathedral dates back to the 6th century. Uh, it's been rebuilt a few times over the years, but just have a look and appreciate the artwork and the beauty in here. I'm standing outside the Parliament of Tbilisi, the Georgian Parliament. And on the footpath here are glass panels representing those who died during the uprising on the 9th of April 1989, when Georgia started to reassert its independence from the Soviet Union. Good place as any to summarise Georgia. It's a country of magnificent landscape, really is. Beautiful countryside, 
lovely people and I've really enjoyed it. It's, uh, it's a country that has a feeling and a spirit of positivity. And I highly recommend a trip to Georgia.